You are joining Making a Difference with Melissa Clark, a new show that shares the compelling stories and voices of well-known and everyday people who change the world in big and small ways. Enjoy our guests. Call in or just listen to be inspired for this show was made with you in mind. Please join us every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with our special guests. And you can listen to our recast at www.melissaclarkshow.com. Hi, thank you so much for joining us here on Making a Difference. I'm Melissa Clark. I'm so thrilled to have my one and only guest, Mr. Peter Mark Jacobson. You may best know him as the co-creator of The Timeless Show, The Nanny, starring the beautiful Fran Drescher. He has such an interesting life. I was so honored to sit down and discuss it with him. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm excellent. How are you? I'm very good. I'm so excited to have you on. I feel like part of the family. I've had Susan on, Susan Holland. Uh, oh, yeah. I've interviewed Miss Drusher several times. I know her. <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, you're in California. I'm in New York. You're from here. You're from Queens. Yes, Flushing. Flushing, Queens. Yes. Wow. How do you like living in California? What do you think the difference is between the two states? People. Uh, you know, I love New York. I mean, New York is my home, and uh, uh, I had a place there for many years, and um, in down, downtown. The only problem I have with New York is yeah. that winter. You know, as I got older, um, I just, it, it was lasted for so long that yeah. I'm, I just, uh, uh, I just uh, couldn't take that cold for so long. So I, um, I, um, Moved to Beverly. <laughs> right. Now I'm wondering how, you know, you grew up here, so a lot of things have changed, especially today. How was it growing up in New York when you were an adolescent, you know, when you were a kid? You know, you look, always look back and it always seems like romanticized, you know? I mean, it was a little town in Flushing, Kew Garden Hills, and, you know, you knew your neighbors, you didn't lock the door. And then around five years old, things began to change where people started locking doors and um, uh, uh, things began to change a lot. But, you know, I had very um, forward thinking parents. Uh, it was when busing started um, back then. And um, uh, that was when they would bring people in from uh, certain communities into our community. And my parents were very, um, insistent that I get to know other people and invite them to my house and I would go to their house and um, that uh, I always was taught that everybody is just the same and um, uh, so uh, at a very young age I, I just you know became kind of like we're all we're just all on this together and um, you know that would be wishful thinking, but unfortunately in New York, <laughs> you, now you grew up in the 70s and 80s, so we're kind of, rever everybody's referring to now that we're, ver we're reverting back to the 70s and 80s with the riots. It's, it's not a pleasant uh, scene here, so, you know, I, I might move to California. I'll come and stay in your, your basement or something. <laughs> it's the same here. I mean, it's no better. It's yeah. the same here. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, you can't marginalize people and not expect it to boil over. Yes. It's like this, this has been happening forever. Right. He's doing anything. And then it comes to a, you know, a, a boiling point. And maybe this time, I have a feeling this time it's going to make, different, make a difference. I hope it does. I really do. Because no one, we all just should be, it's so easy just to treat everyone the same and pay people what they're worth. And, and um, uh, I, I don't understand it. I really don't. I, maybe I'm a, a simpleton, but it just seems very simple to me. Yeah. And so complicated. Yeah, it's a very complicated time right now, but uh, hopefully we'll just breeze through this. I'm actually scared of this whole thing than the COVID, to be honest with you. And a lot of people are saying that. 
but hopefully we'll get through. Okay, let's get to you, sir. I'm so excited to have you on. You have such an interesting life. We have so many topics to get through. I told you I had a whole page here. Let's hope we don't uh -huh. run out of time. <laughs> Is that interesting? <laughs> so, yeah, you have you have a lot of interesting uh, topics that we're going to go through. So you first met uh, Miss Rand Drescher when you were fifteen. Yes. And I saw in an interview you are an openly gay male, and I yes. saw now. that. <laughs> yes. Then. Correct. Correct. But you did have. Did you say it? I saw on a show. I think it was Bravo Network that you had some feelings for some men or same sex at at fifteen. I always think I did. I always thought. Um, I was attracted to men, but I was also attracted to women. So I didn't quite understand it. And back then, it wasn't really like a choice. I mean, I didn't even really know what gay was yeah. uh, in the 60s and 70s. And I just sort of knew that uh, it wasn't what everybody else was doing. And um, in Queens, it, you know, you got, you got engaged after you got out of, college, after you got out of high school then. Mm -hmm. And you got a big ring down at the garment district and which a wonderful friend of mine helped me get. And, um, and then you planned a big wedding that nobody could really afford. Um, and, um, and that was what you did. But, and I, you know, I was attracted to Fran. I loved Fran. I thought uh, this little piece in my head, I just kind of buried down because I didn't know what to do with it. And I wasn't seeing therapists or anything back then. So, right. um, I wasn't trying to harm anybody or do anything wrong. I was kind of trying to do what everybody was telling me I was supposed to do. And um, uh, that was that. Did you have open-minded parents growing up? Yes, very. Mm. They were Unitarians. Um, they, uh, they, they belonged in the village and not um, in Flushing. Uh -huh. I probably would have been a totally different person uh, if I was you know, I, I, I don't think they felt like they fit in where they were either. Right. Did you explore anything at that time when you were 15 with any other gentleman, any other man? I, you you know, know, boys kind of like fool around showing each other their stuff. And, you know, I don't know what girls do at that age. And, but nothing, nothing heavy kind of. Most of my friends that are straight now did the same thing. They were just, uh, ex you know, showing off kind of stuff but there was never any kind of you know romantic kind of thing or anything like that no and, and then i met Fran and you know we were doing the same thing at that age too the girls i mean yeah. you know you're no. exploring you're exploring your bodies and it should be explored and it should be accepted for whatever you decide is right for you yeah. and then a lot of these kind of things would not happen uh because uh, you'd say all right well you know you this is what you want, go for it and uh, be safe. And uh, I support you and I love you and that's it. Again, simple, easy. That's it, yeah. Do you think a lot of people have a hard time with their sexuality even today? Yes, world? not as bad as it was, but yes, I know men that are, that are straight or yeah. that are, are still kind of trying to figure it out and okay. they're in their 50s and uh, you know, Sometimes I kind of lose a little patience and then I think, whoa, don't, because, right. hey, you were there. Be supportive, be helpful, be there to, you know, um, uh, give guidance if you can. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, it's still kind of like, for a lot of guys and women, uh, a hard thing to wrestle with and come to terms with and be able to share you know, I always felt everyone's going to think, well, you were living a false life. I wasn't. I love her. I loved her. We still love each other. Yeah. And, um, but this was a truth that I had to deal with at some point. And it, it just uh, was hard. But we're, we're actually better and closer friends than we are, we are now than we were then. Yeah, we're going to get to that because she told me the whole story of when she got cancer and you came and, you know, you started reconciling um, as friends and a new relationship. So my question to you is, what would you tell someone who's struggling with themselves now? They're listening to this and... Well, I get a lot of call of um, messages when I was on Facebook and, um, of, and on Instagram um, from people that are struggling with it. Yeah. And women and men. I had a young girl that uh, uh, texted me and she said that uh, 
she was going to uh, do harm to herself. And uh, I yeah. said, because she couldn't tell her parents and she couldn't live this way anymore. And I, you know, I said, now, I gave her a number to call, the Trevor Project. I have that number. I'm going to be saying that at the end. That's a great number. Thank you, sir. Wonderful organization. And she, you know, and I, I wrote for her for that day and, uh, and then I didn't hear from her, so I didn't know what she did. Months later, she wrote me and said she did call the Trevor Project and um, thanked me and she told her parents and, uh, it wasn't that easy, but she feels, you know, she was on a road to um, living her authentic life. And I felt so great that, you know, she was able to face that. And I think facing the fear is ha the hardest thing to do, but it's never as hard as uh, hiding behind it. So I, I would, um, if you can afford to see a therapist, definitely see a therapist to talk it through, be as honest as you can with them. They're just there to listen and help you. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, and be kind to the person that if you're with someone who's uh, a girlfriend or, or a boyfriend, be kind to them and make them know it has, it's not their fault and you didn't mean to hurt them. Um, you were trying to make it work because you love them, but yeah. uh, you have to face your um, truth. And um, hopefully the other person will be understanding enough to eventually let it, the friendship grow in a new place. Because if you loved each other then, there's something there. Couples that's always wondered, you know, straight couples too, you know, they, they have these wonderful relationships and children and then they don't talk to each other at all. And you yeah. wonder, th there was love there once, yeah. there's gotta be something there. It may have shifted into something else, but it's worth exploring because especially if you have children, you know? Right. Mm. How did you tell Miss Drescher? Um, as I remember, mm -hmm. I called her on the phone and I said, I just want you to know, in case you ever read something or anything, that, uh, well, I told her early on in our relationships that I thought I was bisexual, but I didn't mm -hmm. want to have that on it. And um, she had this whole thing. She didn't want to be alone. And so we were a perfect storm together. And we had a lot of sex. And so there wasn't, I wasn't cheating on her. Right. But, um, I told her um, after we were divorced that I just I started to date. Uh, I couldn't even say I was gay. I said I'm 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 dating some men. And she was dating a 26 year old good looking guy. Right. So it was like was softened the blow. You know, yeah. it was okay. You do what you want. You know, right, right. We were, we were already divorced and everything. But um, so yeah, that's how I told her, and she was very. Kind, and she said, you know, live your authentic life. Don't waste a moment. Mm -hmm. um, we were only here for 15 minutes. So, you know, enjoy the 15 minutes and be kind and, and, and do the best you can. And uh, so she was very, very supportive and loving. And she was always very supportive of the uh, LGBTQ community. They, uh, um, she always uh, was the first person to stand up for equal rights when other Publicists would tell their celebrities, don't go there. It's, uh, it's a dangerous territory to be in. People don't like it, Baba. She said, I don't care. It's, uh, I, can't, I can't not be there to protect someone's rights. That's, yes. We're all the same and we all deserve equal rights. So, you know, she's always been a, a huge supporter of um, communities. So. Were you then, a oh, no, go ahead. Were you able to tell your parents? Were your parents still? Are your parents no, they don't already passed away. My whole, I'm an orphan at this point. All my oh. parents passed away. And so oh. that part was a little easier because uh, I didn't have to tell anyone. Right. And, you know, as because I was married to her friend, um, oddly enough, it did not come out in the press uh, early on when I came out. And I was living a gay life i'd go to clubs and do all my stuff but i i guess i wasn't um that recognizable uh so uh it actually made things easier and then like you know 10 15 years later i got a call from in touch magazine where they said well they're going to out me and i said out me i'm 
I'm out for <laughs> 20 years. They said, you want to say anything? And I was like, <laughs> not what am I going to say now? It's like, if, if I say something, it looks like I'm looking for attention uh, to have an article written about me. And I said, no, I, I said, you know what we were developing at that point, happily divorced, which I said, if that comes out, we can talk about it. But now it just seems like I'm looking for attention. And I, I don't want to. She said, well, does Fran want to say anything? I said, well, I'll ask her. And she yeah. said, uh, you know, just say, you know, we love each other and we support each other and uh, are there for each other kind of thing, which I did, which yeah. he turned into Fran Drescher outs her husband. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. but meanwhile, we sold, um, when that happened, you know, you got to let the universe do its thing right. because that happened. Next day, we got a call from Oprah because we had done that show before. Yeah. And she said, it was her last year, and she said she'd like us to come on and talk about this. And we looked at each other, and we, and, uh, we got other calls. And she, we said, well, if we're going to say anything, we'll say it to Oprah because she's kind, she's smart, yeah. and, um, uh, and, and that's, you know, we're developing happily divorced, so we can talk about that too. Yes. So we did Oprah, and we mentioned the show that we were doing, and she said, oh, my God, that is a great idea. Which, you know, if Oprah says it's a great idea, you've got, you know, in the next day, I think we got picked up for the show. Yeah. And um, uh, so it all kind of worked out, uh, that, that end of it. Do you feel um, content? I feel, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I am the most comfortable I am within my, my, myself as I, I've ever been. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, in the beginning, you're, you, you have your crazy years, because I didn't, I didn't do any of those crazy years with women or men. That's right. Uh, so I, you know, go to clubs and do all that stuff and drank and, and, uh, and uh, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I met a lot of great people. And, uh, but then, you know, um, I didn't want to, I, 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 I stopped drinking and I um, stopped going to those places and um, uh, things began to calm down a lot more. Mm -hmm. And then I couldn't stay up that late anymore. So it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great thank you so much for being open with us and uh shedding some light on somebody's life if they you know if they're confused today i'd like to go back to the mid 80s um i, I had it <laughs> you don't remember i'll try <laughs> that's right <laughs> so i'd I like to <laughs> i was like I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to one incident that happened um, at your home in California. Uh, the um, intrusion that happened uh -huh. with uh, Miss Drescher and her girlfriend. Uh, the story is in Cancer Schmancer of what happened. Miss Drescher uh, was raped, her and her girlfriend, in front of Mr. Peter Mark Jacobson. Um, I heard her story, and it's in Preferred Health magazine a little bit, but it's more in uh, Cancer Schmancer. Can I get your uh, take on what happened that day? Can we, do you remember? Well, we, we were, I think uh, our friend was coming over to show us plans for her wedding, I think it was. And right. uh, we were just home making dinner, door locked in, you know, in Encino, California. And um, we heard this huge bang and someone knocked down the, uh, two guys knocked down the front door. Uh, and you know, this was a new, condo and um they rushed in with I, at least one gun i think um i'm not sure if they had one or two guns but um you know your heart kind of everything kind of goes into slow motion your heart drops into you and you think wait i've read about this kind of shit but i've never thought it was going to happen to me right and i you, we just couldn't grasp what was happening? Are they going to rob us? Are they going to do? So you know, they started grabbing whatever they could and jewelry, and um, uh, made us go up into the bedroom, and they tied me up, and they gagged me, and put a gun to my head, and you know, it's like, and the phone rang, yeah. and they answered. It. it was my father, and I, I couldn't really say anything, of course, and I would have been killed probably and right. else. So I just was thinking, you know, you kind of think, 
you're not thinking about, you know, the Oscars or the things you didn't get or the fancy stuff you don't have or whatever. You're thinking about, wow, I'm never going to see people again. I'm never going to walk down that street and smell those flowers again. It's all, I'm never going to have my favorite food again. It's all sort of just rushes through your head. And they, um, well, they tied me up. They uh, raped Fran and they raped uh, her friend with a gun to my head. And um, um, and then they grabbed whatever jewelry or whatever was in the house and put it all in our car and took the car and left. Mm-hmm. And we lived. So, um, that's what the police said, because we feel like you did something wrong. And um, they said you lived, so you did something right. Wow. And um, then, you know, we went to the hospital and uh, the ladies have to go through a rape uh, checkup and all that stuff. And uh, I, um, you know, you're numb for a while. And what a lot of people didn't know also was that we moved in with our friends, uh, Dan and Donna Aykroyd, and um, who were so kind and invited us to live there. And we didn't, you know, we're finally going to leave. And they were having a um, a homeowners association meeting back at where we lived because we hadn't been back since. And during that homeowners association meeting, the guy came back again and oh rushed in with a gun and somebody hit him and he ran away right before the police came. The police were coming to tell us that it would be safer. So, you know, they say they never come back, but that also kind of like brought everything back to like that day again. It was like, wow. well, you, you know, you don't, you feel so unsafe in your own skin. You right. kept looking over your shoulder to think somebody's behind you with a gun or can hit you or checking on you or you hear a, a noise and, it takes a long time to recover, but give yourself that time and uh, get help. Yeah. Did you, uh, do you still feel that till this day, like talking about it? Do you go back in time? I've had a lot of therapy since then. Good. So mm-hmm. rarely um, do I. Um, there are some moments that sometimes, but rarely. Um, uh, rarely does that, that come up. Um, so I don't, I feel like I've, but sometimes I think when I'm alone or something, what if, where do I go? Where will I run? Where will I, you know? So yeah, that's, that's about that. Did you think you were going to die when they had, when they had you tied up? Did you, what, do you remember what was going on inside of your head? I don't really remember. Mm. I'm sure it went through my, I'm sure it went through my um, mind. It was all seemed so surreal that is this actually really happening? Wow. Yeah. That I'm sure at the moment I thought that and I was just, the thoughts just keep going all over the place because uh, you just don't, believe it's real and yet it is and uh you're trying not to do something to piss them off that to make it worse right and um and there's nothing i could do i was tied up and um gagged so hey you know mr yeah i'm so sorry you had to go through that um miss drusha was saying when that was happening to her. She was studying his face, uh, the person who was assaulting her at the time, um, so she can get a clear vision. So she was able to help the police with the sketch. Yes. And uh, she was brave to do that. You know, um, not that many people think you go into a panic. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm that people. <laughs> I, I'm, I, was, um, I was more of, of just numb and taking every moment that was happening and just 
I really can't even tell you exactly what I was thinking because I probably tried to block it out. I don't remember. If you feel as if you are still struggling with your sexuality, please head over to the trevorproject.org. For support with sexual assault victims, please head over to rain.org. That's R A I N N.org. Just remember, you are never alone. Let's head over to the nanny. Let's talk about the nanny. Now, before we begin, yeah, <laughs> before we begin, I had an opportunity to thank this beautiful woman, and I want to thank you. And I will explain just for two seconds. After we got off the phone, I interviewed her for Preferred Health Magazine. I was so excited about this. She means a lot to my household. Just like you, I lost both of my parents. I lost them within 18 months apart. So I turned off my handy dandy little recorder here and I said, Miss Drescher, I have to tell you something. When me and mama would come back from chemo, you know, you have to keep her happy. So I said, mama, what would you like to watch? So we would watch, she goes, I wanna watch my nanny. I wanna watch my Fran. And we would, we would watch TV together and we would laugh and it would just be such an amazing time. So, and it meant, it meant so much to me and my family. And I know that I'm speaking on behalf of millions when I say this and, and I wanna say thank you for you, your collaboration together for helping people in the most horrible times of their lives. That was a horrific time in my life, but you too and, and that whole crew got us together. So I wanna say thank you, sir, um, oh. from the bottom of my heart. You know, I get that. That's like, I get that <laughs> from people about that when they're sick or with someone who's sick or scared or can't, you know, they, they put it on and it's the only thing that makes them laugh and brings them out of the, their situation for 20 minutes. Yeah. And it's such a nice thing to hear, to be able to say that, you know, we all were able to do that because it was, you know, a group effort. We, you know, so many people and cast members and writers and, um, but that this little show um, became so well loved all over the world, yeah. uh, you know, in places like Rwanda, you know, the same kind of thing that it reached out that way. Um, we always considered ourselves like the little engine that could. That's right. And it was like, we figured when we did it, well, we'll, we'll do a pilot, we'll pay our bills for the year and um, we'll see. And then, you know, a couple of shows got picked up and then more shows and then all of a sudden it, it became this machine that I used to sit on the steps in the living room. We'd have a big party there every um, Christmas and look at all these hundreds of people that were working this machine and think, wow, how did this happen? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like a whirlwind, right? <laughs> it just... Yeah, it just, and you, if there was no stopping it. It was a machine and, and um, people loved it. And um, it was, you know, and it was just, you know, amazing. That that it was, happened. you know what it was? It was the fashion. It was how beautiful she was. It was the sexual tension between her and Mr. Sheffield. Oh, since we were 18, we wanted to do a TV show. A sitcom. Mm. I mean, we used to watch, you know, Lucy and stuff like that and analyze it. And uh, her mom used to come into our, into our room and say, oh my God, if you guys could just make a living doing this, you know, because uh, we were 18 years old. Yeah. And from that moment, we were always thinking of ideas for either the two of us to do a show together. And um, we, you know, learned by doing it, you know, we'd be guests or um, um, uh, we'd write, write um, scripts and um, Nothing happened, but we prepared and prepared and prepared and prepared. And then one day, uh, this happened. And I remember Frank called me and said, what do you think about the sound of music? Except I come to the door and I said, that's it. That's the idea. Will, and I said, what about making him a Broadway producer so that can bring in the glamour and all the people and blah, blah, blah. And she loved that idea. And we started to, you know, form this idea of a show, which we went to CBS. It was sold as, you know, Fran Drescher is a nanny from hell. Uh, and 
you know, they said yes. Right. You know, now we'd never done a show. <laughs> so they put us with another team, Rob Sternin and Prudence Frazier, who did Who's the Boss. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a perfect fit because they immediately said to us, look, this is your show. We're gonna guide you, but it's your show. And, uh, you know, and they did, and we're friends today. Um, so it was just an amazing, you know, everything, including the costumes, which the studio didn't want her wearing costumes like that. They said, just put her in jeans and a t-shirt. And we said, no, that's going to be a very big part of the show. Right. And they didn't see it, but the head of the studio, um, when we finished our last episode, came over to me and said, you were right. And I just want to let you know that you were right. And I said, well, you know, that was nice of him to say. Usually people forget that kind of stuff. Right, right. Uh, but he was very kind. And uh, today there are still accounts out there, you know, talking about her clothing. That uh, Brenda Cooper, who was a costume designer, brilliant costume designer. Um, and we've worked together since. And, uh, you know, um, she spoke our language. She knew, she knew how to do this. And she did it so creatively. And, you know, the first two years, we didn't have much money on the show. Right. Uh, but she, she formed these looks that uh, are still, you know, they're still talking about today. So pretty amazing. How did you feel when you first went on the set the first time? When you first saw the whole set and everything? Um, well, you know, we had a lot to do with the actual design of the set. Okay. You see models of it, you see, um, we didn't want it to, we wanted it to be kind of beige. So mm -hmm. that clothing, uh, she could wear anything and um, uh, it wouldn't clash with it. So if you notice, it's all kind of like this cream colored set. Yeah. And, you know, and they're always in their like uniforms in black and white and beige. And she's always this rainbow that floats through, um, uh, uh, floats through. Um, so it was done purposely. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when we first saw it, you know, there were some adjustments, but it's a different set that when, than when it was in the pilot. See, because the pilot was, we only got um, offered to do a, um, what they called a pilot presentation, which mm -hmm. is half money, do 15 minutes. We'll see if we like it. But Rob Sternin, who said, listen, let's do the whole show make it for less money, uh, I don't want to do half. And so we did a whole show and they ended up actually buying it and airing it. So if you watch it, mm -hmm. you'll see it's actually a different set. Yes, we just, yes. We the money for that set. And uh, then they designed the set that we wanted for the uh, actual show. I'm, I'm surprised they never, they just didn't say reshoot it, but yeah. Yeah. You wrote, some of the, you wrote the episodes. You actually wrote for Who's the Boss? You did one episode in 86, I saw. Yeah, I did a, um, I did a um, spinoff okay. for Fran and Donna Dixon. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called Charmed Lives that Eve Branstein actually um, created. Mm -hmm. that I worked uh, on a little bit with her uh, because I knew the girl so well, um, helping her with what I thought it should be. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, she, it's really her show. And uh, I, I came up, were part of the idea, I think. So um, that was, you know, I think that was the first pilot idea that I had um, my name on. Mm. I was an actor at the same time and I didn't want to give up acting because, but the writing was coming much easier to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very neurotic as an actor. Um, so eventually, you know, I sold Dan Aykroyd an idea that that Fox made and he loved. And that was the same year we sold The Nanny and it was sort of like, maybe this is the way I should be in my career. This is happening where the other one is so hard. Yeah. So, yeah. What yeah. advice would you give to somebody who wants to get into your field? Well, you know, what's interesting now is that if you're a writer, mm -hmm. most, most producers in sitcoms are writers. Right. Um, uh, and uh, if you are a writer, you have the ability to make your own product on your phone. I mean, you can edit 
film it, make it look unbelievably professional, write it, and there's no excuse not to do it. You don't have to wait for CBS to say, right. okay, here's the money. Now, and even now, if you do something that people like and they keep watching, you know, they'll pay you, ad companies will pay you to, to have their little commercials on there and stuff. That's right. So you don't have to do it. If you want to do it the way I did it, mm -hmm. you know, it's harder. Uh, you have to uh, be lucky. You have to write. You have to have examples of your writing. Mm -hmm. you get an agent. Uh, someone to look at it, uh, package it sometimes with a star if you can. There's no one way of doing it. I mean, you know, I, I uh, my story is one way, but that's not the way it usually happens. Usually writers start at the bottom as yeah. firm writers or staff writers and work their way up. Um, I went right to being an executive producer um, only because Dan Aykroyd fought for me and said, no, he came up with the idea. He's writing it. He should yeah. be, he should be the executive producer. If you want to put him with somebody else, that's fine. But you know, why? What he's going to be doing all the work. So it was people like him that you know, who recognized what I could do, nice. and stood up for me, where um, and had the ability and the power to. And Fran too. She always wanted me on her show because she knows what I bring to her shows, and uh, and um, she feels a talent feels safe with certain writers because they know they have their best interest, their best interest at heart. Mm. They know they're gonna look at the lighting. They know they know that the you know they're gonna make sure they're filmed properly. They're gonna know that, you know, what they're wearing, if it's not right, they're gonna say, I will wait 20 minutes, change. You know, that the makeup is right, that the hair is right, that everything, you know, I had my hand in everything, uh, as did Fran and the nanny. Um, and uh, that's part of the reason we, I guess, got divorced too, because I became so controlling. Yeah. Uh, because I wasn't really paying attention to who I was. Right. Um, uh, but it was a perfect excuse, I guess, just to make sure, you know, everything was the way I, we saw it. Well, right. that's, may, may I intervene? I think because you didn't have control over your own sexuality. So that was, the show was your baby. That was your control. Do you think perhaps? Oh, yeah, well, she was. Yeah, she was. I, I, you know, controlled her weight, her yeah. war, what she oh. looked, makeup, the hair, wow. costumes, the script, mm. um, you know, and after a while, you know, she felt suffocated. Just said, yeah, no, it's too much. I can't. And then we go home together too. And, you know, was exhausted and uh it was because i was you know not focusing in on what i should have been focusing in which was me and my right. issues um uh and once i did that and and dealt with all that and that's why i think our our relationship is much better now because none of that is my business right and even work together then the second time on um happily divorced it was a different experience because we didn't have all that stuff, you know? Yeah. And there was a time uh, where you didn't talk and uh, I'd like to get into when you found out that she had cancer. Yeah. After the, sh you know, we split up in the middle of the nanny. It was tough because I was angry. I didn't want, the, I didn't want it to end. And, right. And uh, our relationship, because I, I didn't want to face who I was. I mean, I was being fixed up with, Sharon Stone, and I said no, and I thought, oh my God, you have to be gay. <laughs> and turning down Sharon Stone, um, uh, there's something, something's wow. going. On. But right. I, um, the last, we filmed the last episode, and we were barely speaking to each other. And the party was the next day for the rap party, which I didn't want to go to. I was right. moving to New York to get away from everybody. And, and myself, and I went to the party. We didn't even say hello to each other. Oh. I got in the car, drove home, and the next morning moved to New York for six years. And in, I wasn't speaking to her, and I figured, well, that was it. We'll never speak to each other again. Because I'm not blaming her. I was my fault. I 
I didn't want to deal with anything. So, you know, this is something everybody can look at themselves when you're angry at somebody. What part do I have in this? Right. And I have a big part of it. And um, I got a call that from her manager, our manager, that she uh, had cancer. And at that moment, everything just sort of like washed away. And it was right. like, I knew she was seeing somebody. I knew they, I think they were living together. Maybe, I'm not sure, but I said, well, what can I do? Can I come out and take care of her? Can I, you know, or does she want me to stay away from her? Uh, whatever she wants, tell her I love her. I, I will be there for her if she wants me to come out there or I will stay away. Whatever, no, no judgment or anything. I just want to do whatever I can. Mm -hmm. to her. And I got a call back that she does want to talk to me, but not till all this is, you know, the surgery's over and all that stuff. And um, I said, fine. And I stayed on the phone with my manager uh, in contact uh, during the surgery. And it was, you know, cancer, but it was all removed and uh, she's okay. And then like a little while later, I got a call that, you know, we started talking. I was going out to cast a movie and uh, we, we got together and, you know, it was awkward walking through the house, you know, see pictures of her with another man. And, um, but my friend said to me once, if you're going to have a relationship with her, mm -hmm. um, you're going to have to start fresh and not look back, but start from today and build from that. And that's what we did. And everything that was strong within us, our humor and what we had in common and food and all that stuff, all began to come back and our love for each other and support for each other. And I only wanted the best for her. And uh, it, you know, became obvious we were soulmates and, you know, she'd fix me up on dates, I'd fix her up on dates. Um, and uh, we'd laugh and, you know, I'm very, very, very blessed and lucky to have her in my life. And I know some people don't understand it and they don't, they'd say, I'd be mad at that person and I wasted their life or, you know, um, but nobody was held there. We were both part of this because we wanted to be part of it. Yeah. until we didn't want to be part of it. And um, sometimes it takes a while to someone realizes and re is ready to make a move. Right. But you don't have to throw away all the good if you're able to look at yourself deeply and say, well, what can I do to change this for the better and see if there's anything still there that we can... Because you don't meet people that you're friends with for 30, mm -hmm. 40 years mm -hmm. very often. Right. Those are the friendships you want to hold on to. And uh, so I'm, I'm very lucky that we're so close. Yeah, it was important for you to be with her when she was going through this. Yeah, and, uh, and, um, and uh, knock on wood, 20 years. Yeah, it's truly amazing. So thank you for all that information. Uh, you guys just did a table read for the Nanny episode one, which was incredible. It had like 1.6 million viewers. And that, was, that, that was just that one, one um, the Sony site, there was another site that had 2.6 million on top of that. So mm. there were four and a half million people that saw that. That was pretty crazy. That was pretty amazing. And you narrated the whole uh, episode. Yes. Well, we didn't know how to do all the stage directions. Yeah. And then um, the Rob Sternin said, well, why don't you just read them? You know, uh, and his, uh, his daughter and her boyfriend wrote them out basically as more like dialogue with some jokes and stuff. So, you know, who were born when we were doing the show. And um, uh, so that's how that came to pass. And uh, I, uh, when this happened with the COVID thing and people were, very, very, still are very scared. And I was like, mm. what can we do to make people smile? Just like you said with your mom. Yeah. 
And I said, well, what if we got the cast back together to do, I don't know if they'd want to do it. And Fran said, she thought it was a great idea. She called Sony, they got right on board. Uh, and um, the cast was all, you know, thrilled to do it. And um, it was lovely to see all of them again. And um, uh, it's still up there if you want to watch it. Um, yes. It was it's fun and, and it still held up. That's what was really amazing. We needed that at that point. That's yes. what we needed, yeah. We needed a laugh. And you were part of the cabaret that they do, a uh, cancer schmancer organization. Uh, they, they're usually in New York and they do a cabaret. And uh, this one had uh, Bette Midler and Patti Lapone, uh, amazing other talents. And you actually sang, I loved it so much, beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I used, to be, I used to do musicals when I was younger. Mm. Um, and um, I did some in New York and some here. And, uh, but then when I became a producer, uh, you know, you kind of let that go. I mean, it was always been my dream to be in a Broadway show. And um, I still haven't got, I did off Broadway, but I never got Broadway, to Broadway. And um, uh, so, you know, it's still on my bucket list. I love it so much. We, we got to wait until next year because they just closed. Broadway. I know. And, you I know, we're working like... on the Broadway musical of The Nanny. That's right. That's right. So, uh, it's sort of, so I'm up on all what's happening and uh, it's just, uh, I, it's so awful because these actors and stagehands and oh, you know, they don't yes. do a lot of money, you know, unless you're a star of a show and then to just stop for a year, basically, it's very scary. So the Broadway League is, you know, a good yeah. place to put some money if you can. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And the, the restaurants too around there too. Everybody's going to suffer. What a horrible time, but we just got to smile through it and just be hopeful and, and, uh, and you know, that the link actually, uh, the cabaret, you can find that on my website, uh, melissabillyclarkshow.com. I had asked Susan if I can put it up on my website. Okay. And uh, so please, if anybody hasn't seen it, go and see it and donate to the Cancer Schmancer organization. Uh, they have amazing uh, the Corona Care for You they have as well. Great yeah. information. Uh, so after The Nanny, you did uh, What I Like About You. Yes, Amanda Mines. And yes, Jenny Garth, yeah. yes. So that would be a couple of times you worked with uh, Jenny Garth. The 902 I, I worked with Jenny Garth as an actor when I was in 90210. Okay. And then I worked with Jenny Garth on this, uh, on, on What I Like About You, because my friend and... Um, Part one of my, Karen Lucas, who uh, was on The Nanny, mm -hmm. and then I've worked on all of her shows, which now I'm doing a Netflix show for her called Country Comfort that she created. Um, a brilliantly talented, wonderful friend, um, uh, so creative, so, and we have the same work ethic, and we love working with each other, we laugh a lot. And um, uh, so, you know, uh, yes, Jenny. Jenny is a delight, and uh, so was Amanda. Yeah, and that was a fun show to work on. And happily divorced, you were the co-creator, and that was based upon your relationship with Miss Stresher. Yes, yes. She went into TV land and, and sold it as you know, uh, sold the idea in, in a lot at a lunch, and the next thing we knew, we were making a pilot, and um, I hadn't seen them for a while. And the other day, somebody sent me them, and I started watching them. It was a really funny show. I was like, wow, this is a funny show. <laughs> I like the actor. Uh, he's, what's his name, the prime actor that was playing? John Michael Higgins. Yes, he's wonderful. So funny. I like him. He was the last guy to come into the part. We couldn't find the guy to play me. Mm. And um, uh, we were actually going to put it on hold, and then he came in. And right then we all looked at each other and said, that's it. Love it. He's amazing. Yeah, he's so And you and I kind of worked together with the Pet Lifestyle magazine, and we thank you so much. You were the yeah. photographer, and it was the, the, my senior, the uh, editor-in-chief, she said the publisher was, was so happy with everything, the, what she was wearing, um, the lighting, the decor. It was amazing. Uh, Pet Lifestyle magazine. Um, uh, Peter Mark Jacobson did the photography for uh, her because you couldn't get a film, you know, somebody to come in and, and do it because we were in quarantine at the time. All those selfies paid off. All those selfies, that's right. 
<laughs> so that was that was really amazing, and we thank you so much for that. It was fun. It was fun to do. I mean, it was so easy. She's such an easy subject to photograph, and she's got a good, great eye. So mm. you know, between the two of us, we just you know figured it out, and um, and the dog was so cooperative. So sweet. Um, that uh, you know, I was so happy you chose that. They chose that one for the cover too, because it's such a beautiful cover. I loved and, uh, it. Yeah, they, it, was, it was a beautiful article too. You did a great job. Thank you very much. I love to write about animals, so every everything comes from here anyway. But animals, uh, I love it, and I was just so happy about her. Her story was amazing. So please go to Pet Lifestyle Magazine, uh, and you could read the whole article. It's a beautiful story, and she's got a beautiful dog now, Angel Grace, and yes. you have a dog named Donut. Donut. <laughs> so Donut. Cute. What kind of dog is Donut? Donut is a Pomsky. She's a little, a Pom and a Husky mix. Oh my God. She's the cutest little dog so and sweet. the funniest little dog. But um, <laughs> got so much energy. I, I hear, this is a picture of the two of us. You see it. Yeah. Donut dog. Wow. So a Pom, would you say a Pomeranian and a Husky? Yeah, so it's like a little husky, a 30 pound husky. Oh my God. Yeah, with the energy of a 90 pound husky. That's right. I love it. That's, so, that's your little companion. Yeah, she's my little donut. God yeah. bless. Yes. So you do everything. You're an actor, director, producer, creator, singer, ex husband, beautiful man. God bless you. What's next? What do you, what, do you have anything in the works right yeah, now? If they ever open. Um, <laughs> What's next? Well, we're doing the musical. We're working on the musical of the Nanny for Broadway. Right. So that's taking up a lot of our time um, with Rachel Bloom, who did uh, Crazy X, the brilliant Rachel Bloom, and Mark Rooney, who directed Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's uh, actually, we're catching up on a lot because nobody's doing Broadway right now. Mm -hmm. um, and after this, I'm going into a meeting for that. And um, and I'm working on the Netflix show, Country Comfort, with Catherine uh, uh, Foster, mm -hmm. Catherine e. Foster, and Eddie, Eddie Cibrian. And um, uh, that's sort of a nanny-ish kind of show, too, where, uh, uh, but it's country, and they sing more like the sound of music, where they actually do it. sing. Mm. And uh, Catherine is, they're both just lovely people, and um, is talented, and we're halfway through the season, but then we got closed down. Yeah. So, I hear we're going back in August if all goes well. Um, otherwise, um, you know, it's day by day. You just keep, you know, are we going back today? You know? I know, right? Are you, are you the writer on there? A writer, yes. Writer, okay. One of the writers. And the Karen Lucas uh, uh, created it. Um, she also did Miss Congeniality and one of the writers on that show, movie. And uh, she worked on The Nanny and um, uh, What I Like About You. and we kind of always like to work together on things. She's, uh, she's always the best. She's great, she's a great lady. Nice when you work with good people. Oh, Especially I'm, in this industry. <laughs> Frank Lombardi, yeah. uh, Diane Wilk, uh, Rob, Rob and crew, they're all, so many. They're, they're, the nanny, they're probably were 50, 50 uh, Jane, uh, Jane and, um, I'm forgetting a million of them, but uh, there were so many that worked on there that were so good. And uh, thank every one of them because it's not one person that makes these shows happen, believe me. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, a, it's an army. Yeah. Well, you're amazing. And I thank you so much for being on this show. Really appreciate it. And uh, you can head over to your Instagram. I know that you just changed your name, official Peter Mark Jacobson. Yeah, because, you know, I've had a lot of problem with people. Uh, making fake accounts with different names and then catfishing women. And, oh, wow. Um, you know, in Europe, here, um, hundreds and hundreds and date sites. So if you see my face on a date site, other, you know, it's not me. Don't give anybody money. Ladies. That's terrible. Give can, people money. Can you get checked uh, the verification, Peter? Instagram won't give me one. Come on. I know. Come on. I know. Come on. Are you kidding me? I know. It's, uh, you know, insane. But A they cat were... gets verified. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come but, uh, on. This is Peter Mark Jacobson. Verify him already. <laughs> but, wow. Uh, well, I left, I le I left uh, 
Facebook because there were, you know, there were just so many and every day women would, would, would knock on my page and say, uh, you know, there's a fake account on this and there's a fake account on Cupid and, and I know about them and I've repeat, reported to the police, but most of them are in a, a gang in another country and uh, I'm not the only one. There's many yeah. men that do this. So, but if you see me on something, uh, except Instagram, uh, it's not me. So. My God. People have to find things to do with their time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I thank you so much. Thank you for the nanny bringing it to our lives uh, and, and your creation with the wonderful Miss Fran Drescher. Um, and uh, thank you for just being wonderful and being you. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me on. It was my pleasure. And uh, yeah. I wish you a great year and uh, many people around you. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the information with... Uh, with helping people out there. I'm sure you've made a difference in, in people's lives today with all the topics that we discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Bruno's Restaurant located at 158-22 Cross Bay Boulevard, Queens, New York for sponsoring the show. Bruno's is family operated with the finest of Italian cuisine, daily specials, and brick oven pizza. They are currently serving outside dining.